Well, Kel, thanks for joining us today. We always appreciate it. Uh, maybe start off with, I know you had a nice keynote this morning, and uh, I thought maybe you could get a little, little more insight on maybe how CCA members should approach uh, the transformation that's happening across the, across the mobile telecom space. I mean, obviously for these guys, uh, they're smaller operators, but they are part of the big ecosystem. I guess, how does Ericsson view maybe their, their place in this whole transformation for, for, the, uh, for the mobile telecom space? I mean, obviously they will, they will play a role in the transformation, and they will have to participate in the transformation. The challenge though is to figure out how they participate in that transformation and mm -hmm. how do they figure out what use cases is relevant for them. And so it's, a, it's really about understanding your environment, figuring out you know, who are the users, what are the use cases, what are the willingness to pay and, pay and build a business case that support a use case. So in, in, in an urban market, maybe you know, a connected car solution might be you know, a good solution. Mm -hmm. in, an, in a rural market, maybe it's about healthcare and how do you manage uh, home healthcare for elderly mm -hmm. uh, versus, you know, say another type of application. So it's important that for every rural community, the, the rural carrier understand what is the application that makes sense for their situation and work with, you know, companies like us to help put that together into a business case and then ultimately into product and system requirements. Makes sense. So obviously even for the, it's, it's almost like what the big guys have to do, you know, go through those use cases, scenarios, but just on a smaller scale for what they what they need in their communities then. Yeah, I mean yeah. the big guys are doing that. They're yeah. doing that in terms of what works for in their environments, yeah. what are the kinds of use cases make sense for them. They're, you know, backing into what kinds of then system requirements are necessary, what does the product needs to look like, and you know, hence you have a, a solution that would work. Makes sense, makes sense. Now obviously, maybe connected with that a little bit is, I know there's a lot of talk about 5G and IoT, and I know in your speech you kind of talked a little bit about that as well. I know for these small guys, you know, maybe those terms are maybe a little more forward looking for them, but I guess, how should they look at, you know, at, at that approach at this point? I mean, it's probably still early in the game for them, but I guess how do you view, where, where should they be today in terms of their moves towards, towards 5G and IoT? Uh, you know, as I talked about this morning, I mean, if you think of the previous Gs, yeah. it was very much a very well understood customer. It was yeah. the it was the consumer or maybe an enterprise customer. Yeah. It was about voice and data. Yeah. I think as we look at 5G, we have to start thinking about who is going to be the user for that. What are the use cases? And obviously, IoT is a big use cases. And as I showed this morning, yeah. you know, the machines are going to outpace humans by 2021. That was, There's a, great, yeah, that was a great stat you showed. 15 yeah. billion machines versus 13 billion human devices. And so what that means is that the rural carriers have to start thinking about that. And it's, no, it's not something that they will do this year, next year. But certainly, there is a process and a set of steps that need to, need to be gone through here for them to evolve from the current 4G network into a 5G environment and offering service and solution beyond the traditional customer they were accustomed to serving. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting point there. I know obviously for these guys, it's, it's a big move, but something you have to kind of at least, at least be looking at it and start, and just starting the transition, at least looking at the process and, and know what's ahead of them. Otherwise, so, so they're not so like scared of the whole, of the whole situation. So yeah, and, and, it'll have, and it'll have an impact on their business models. Yeah. It'll have an impact on their organizational structure. You'll have an impact on their go-to-market model. Yeah. How do they service an IoT type customer versus a typical you know, store where you'll sell a, a handset to an end user? Yeah. If you have thousands of IoT devices, how do you provision those on a network? So there are, there are more and different challenges that have to be looked at in the context of an IoT 5G environment. Makes sense. Now, I know, I know a topic you, you touched on this morning too was kind of the move towards virtualization. Obviously, NFE and SDN and cloud are becoming bigger parts of the whole conversation in the ecosystem out there. Again, for these small guys, it's probably maybe a little down the road for them, but, but I guess what's your view on the impact that virtualization is going to have on, on, on these small guys, on their networks? I mean, it, it, obviously, it's, it's a road they're going to have to go down at some point, but how do you view that impact uh, you know, from, what, you're, from your, what you guys are seeing in terms of how it will impact their, their operations? Well, it's, it's a step that is necessary. Yeah. I mean, if you, we, when we talk about 5G, we talk about a concept of network slicing. Yeah. And so for you to do network slicing, you have to have a virtualized environment because the network slicing is essentially linking a bunch of software modules together to create a solution for a specific you know, particular segment that you're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. And so virtualization will be a necessary thing that has to happen. It will take time. You know, the, the, the challenge is to figure out where to start yeah. and how to build a transition plan so that you get a, a virtualized network over time. Yeah. Because by the time the 5G radios are ready, you want to be in a position where you have a virtualized network to serve the kinds of use cases we were talking about that are necessary 
uh, for that a virtual network is necessary to support. Yeah, that seems like one of a great angle too for a company like Ericsson or any vendors out there to really kind of be kind of that stepping stone or that, that helper for these operators. Because again, this is probably big moves that they're not probably, they don't have the, the, uh, the personnel in place to handle, but to have a good partner in, in place is Absol a big part of helping them do that. Absolutely, like we're, that. we're very much uh, looking at this problem um, across the board. We're yeah. looking at it in terms of how does virtualization apply to the various different segments in the market. So yep. you have the very big players, you have mid-sized players, and you have very small players. And each one of them will approach the topic and the challenges of virtualization differently. Yep. And so as a vendor and as a partner, we, to our customers, we look at uh, what are the challenges for the various segments and how do we facilitate and enable success in these segments to virtualize their networks. Yeah, great insight there. Then maybe a final top, uh, question. I'll, I know one thing you touched on also was the uh, intelligent connectivity, I think is what, it, what you refer to it as. And it kind of almost really dug into kind of this whole process of what 5G and everything's going to be in terms of controlling a network. Maybe you can touch a bit more on, on kind of what that was about and kind of how you view the importance of this for, uh, for mobile operators out there. Yeah, the, what I was, what, uh, the point I was trying to make is that 4G and 5G will coexist. Yep. And the way 4G and 5G will coexist is that we will let the 5G systems, which is probably high bandwidth, yeah. uh, handle the, the application and the use cases that that should handle, and let the 4G network handle the use cases that it's designed to handle. Yeah. And the way to do that is through a couple of uh, mechanisms. One is, today we use carrier aggregation, yeah. where we're, we're aggregating low band and mid band spectrum mm -hmm. to allow the mobile to connect uh, to the low band spectrum yeah. So like that an, like an anchor almost. Anchor so that, in the yeah. low band spectrum yeah. so that the, it, it has a better um, uplink uh, performance as far as the high band spectrum is concerned. Yeah. And then this allows the high band spectrum to serve the mobile from a downlink standpoint because the downlink power is higher than the uplink. Yeah. And right? all the video coming down from the downlink. Exactly. From down the, too, and, yeah. and so the same thing will apply to a 5G, 4G environment where we will, we, we're talking about the concept of dual connectivity. Yeah. So you anchor the, uh, the mobile from a signaling standpoint in the 4G network, and then you let the, the 4G network, or the, you could say the, the, the RAN controller, sure, yep. direct the data traffic yep. uh, in terms of which is the best network for the data traffic to run over. Yeah. If, the, if the mobile is in a 5G uh, environment, then maybe the data traffic runs over 5G. If it's in a 4G, it runs over 4G. So the ability to use both spectrum intelligently by anchoring the signal and um, leveraging which data plane mm -hmm. makes most sense. Yeah, and that seems to be pretty important too because a lot of these small guys are just now in the midst or maybe finishing up their 4G deployments and for them, they want to make sure they get them as much usage as possible out of yeah. those networks. They don't want to also have to like scrap these networks. They want to be able to use these as much as they can and if they can use that to support 5G, that's a big Yeah, and that was guys. one of my points this morning that the 4G network, uh, you need a good strong 4G network yeah to offer up some of the 5G uh, capability we're talking about. Yeah. Because you want to leverage both networks. Yeah. And um, we've done simulations which shows that you get an increased performance, significant increased performance, mm -hmm. if you can leverage both networks using these concepts of uh, uh, smart connectivity. Yeah, so well, I, know, I know there's always talk about 5G, but operators should know that 4G spending should not be cut off yet. There's obviously still a lot to do, with, a lot to go with 4G at least, and that's, that's a good base layer for 5G, so. A yeah, there's still there's still a lot can be squeezed out of 4G network. Yeah. There's a lot of technologies that we're looking at in 5G that can apply to 4G. Yeah. Uh, massive MIMO, multi-user MIMO, a lot of the virtualized RAN concepts. Yeah. So a lot of these can be applied in the 4G network to increase the capacity of the 4G. So you get more out of the 4G as you plan towards a 5G uh, uh, road. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, great. We've gotten, definitely appreciate the time today. Thanks so much for it. Thank you. All right, thanks.